Welcome to our webinar on the Greater Cambridge Local Plan, the first proposals. As you'll have just heard the announcement, um, this is being recorded so that we can put it on our YouTube channels and on our website after the event, because we know there are some people who uh, would like to watch it who may not be able to attend this evening. Um, and any questions that we can't answer this evening, we'll answer in writing as well, and we'll put them up on our website as well over the next couple of days. Um, we're really happy to see so many people come this evening to hear about the, the stage we're at with the local plan. Um, I'm just, I'm Hannah Loftus, I'm the communications and engagement lead for the shared planning service here. Um, and we've got on our panel tonight with us uh, Stephen Kelly, who is the Joint Director for Planning and Economic Development at the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Service. Um, and we also have my colleagues Caroline Hunt and Jonathan Dixon, who've been absolutely instrumental in bringing this plan together. I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction now to say where we are in the process. Um, as always with the webinars, please put questions into the Q&A. Um, we'll answer them once we've gone through the presentation um, and hopefully pick up as many as we can. Um, and as I said, those that we can't pick up um, tonight, we will answer in writing. So we held a first conversation consultation in early 2020, as many of you know. Um, that was an issues and options stage consultation. Um, so that was really about the big picture, some of the opportunities, some of the challenges that the new plan might have to face to hear what all of you thought and, and many people across the whole area uh, thought about uh, what we should be focusing on in the new plan. We've been publishing various reports and research since then and further consultation and engagement has been taking place. And now we're at the stage where we have published the first proposals. This isn't yet open for consultation. Uh, they've been published for consideration by the elected councillors of both councils. And I think it's important for everyone to understand that. Uh, as part of the, the process that we go through with the local plan, the councillors need to approve the first proposals to go out to consultation and as part of that they can also ask for changes to be made so that's why these are not open for consultation just yet they will be open for consultation once we've made any of those changes that are agreed with our councillors um, and those therefore represent the, the proposals that the councils collectively would like to put forward to you for your comment you can see at the bottom here uh, the timetable for the plan. So this is just one stage in, in many further stages of plan making. This is the first time we're putting something on the table uh, for uh, in terms of proposals, suggestions for the plan. We'll go to full draft plan next year, um, proposed submission plan the year after that. And there are full public consultations at both of those stages as well. Um, and then it goes through to the Secretary of State um, and to, into the examination process. So that is when a planning inspector appointed by the government looks at our plan, decides whether they think that it's sound. Um, they can also recommend some changes uh, and then hopefully it goes through to adoption. So what are the first proposals? Where are we? What does this really mean? The first proposals are not a full draft plan, they're not full draft policies. It's really the outline, it's the it's a direction of travels, uh, direction of travel for the plan. Um, it includes the vision and aims, it includes the overall amount of development uh, that we think we should plan for, the main sites we think should be developed, and some of the key policy proposals that we think should be implemented in the new plan. So it's not a fully formed plan. You'll see that when we're talking to the, to, talking about the thematic policies, for instance, we're talking about proposed policy direction. We're not saying in chapter and verse, this is exactly what that wording is going to say. Um, and that's because we really want to hear the feedback from all parts of our community um, about whether they think that policy direction is the right direction. And then we can go on to flesh out the detail of the policies. Alongside the first proposals, we publish a really large amount of the evidence and the underlying research that has informed the plan. And that can all be read on our digital document library. So there are topic papers, uh, one per theme and one for the development strategy, um, and a number of reports and, and research papers that form the evidence base, including the housing and economic land availability assessment, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So this is the guiding vision that is part of the first proposals. 
Um, and this really captures uh, the overriding ambition and aim for the plan. And as you can see here, it is about marrying a really significant decrease in our climate impacts with a big increase in the quality of everyday life for all our communities. Uh, those two things we think should go hand in hand. Um, we want to look at reducing carbon emissions and particularly reliance on the private car, creating thriving neighborhoods. That's about having the right variety of jobs and homes, not just one kind of jobs, not one kind of homes suits everybody. Uh, increasing nature, wildlife and green spaces. We, we know that biodiversity and green spaces is a really important theme for our communities and for our councillors. And of course, safeguarding our unique heritage and landscapes. Our plan takes inspiration from what is unique about our area. Uh, we've studied the area in depth and we, um, we want to build on that and not lose what is characterful and important about it, but also looks to the future. This is a plan for the next 20 years. So it's important that we're future facing. We look at technology, we, new, we look at new trends and we harness them to bring the vision to fruition. How has this informed the plan? Well, that, that overarching vision sits above seven uh, objectives, aims that, that uh, are thematic. So these correspond to the themes of the plan. So each theme has a broad overarching aim that helps to guide the policies that sit within that thematic area. And overall, those themes have influenced where we choose to suggest sites for development and uh, where how, how our green infrastructure strategy comes forward. Um, and many other parts of the plan. So they really do intersect very strongly. It's not that they sit in silos, they work together as a whole. And I think what's something that's really special about this plan is that we have looked at them from the start very holistically. They aren't bolt-ons after the event. They have been looked at from the start with very detailed research and evidence behind them um, and have heavily influenced the choice of sites that we've put forward in the first proposals. I'm now going to hand over to Caroline, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about the development we need to plan for, the numbers and the strategy. Thank you, Hannah. Good evening, everyone. So, uh, yes, the local plan is a formal planning document. Uh, we have national planning policy guidance through a framework that the government prepares that sets out how we have to prepare our plans. And that says that we have to identify what it calls our objectively assessed need for housing and for other uses. It sets a standard method for calculating the minimum level of housing need, but it says that there can be circumstances where actual housing need is, is higher. Um, alongside that, the framework requires plans to support economic growth um, and the continuing strength of the greater Cambridge economy um, as one of the most important research and innovation led employment locations in the UK is something we do need to, to look at and consider properly, um, including its implications for housing needs. And the evidence that we have, um, have had prepared says that the, most, uh, the, the forecast level of jobs to be delivered in our plan period from 2020 to 2041 is 58 and a half thousand new jobs. Um, and they suggest that there should be some flexibility in the number of jobs that we provide. Um, and the evidence also says that 44,400 homes are needed to support those jobs. And if we look as a comparison with the level of housing that the standard method would give us that would give 36,600 new homes over the plan period and that would support only 45,800 jobs um, and as you can see that's considerably less than the new jobs that have been um, forecast to come forward in our plan period and on an annual basis it would actually be rather less than we've um, seen delivered over recent years and therefore we think there's a uh, a strong reason why we say our objectively assessed need is the uh, forecast level of new jobs and the number of homes that are needed to support those jobs. It is important to recognise that our evidence was uh, prepared in pre-COVID times uh, and we will clearly need to review the impacts of COVID in, uh, as best we can as we move through the plan process. 
Um, but we haven't looked to update that evidence at this point because we're still really in the middle of this um, pandemic and it's really difficult to predict what changes, long-term changes in particular, there might, might be. So we know there may be some changes and we will keep that under review as we go through the process. Um, and we have also considered, well, what would be the situation if we were to plan for, for fewer homes? Uh, so, as I said, our, our evidence is that the jobs growth is likely to, to continue, recognising the special qualities of the Cambridge economy. And if we plan for fewer homes, that's likely to have a number of different effects. Um, if we don't provide the homes in Greater Cambridge, then assuming the jobs are still created, then people are going to have to commute from further afield. And that has implications for climate change and for congestion. We know that location is the biggest single factor in uh, climate uh, emissions. Uh, housing could also become in, in shorter supply and even more unaffordable. And we know affordability is already a, a serious issue in, in this area. Um, and also we have to prepare a plan that responds to our evidence. And Hannah mentioned the independent examination that comes at the end of the plan making process. And it needs to be found sound is the term. Um, and that means that it has to be positively prepared and, under, and, and, and responds to, to the evidence. Uh, there's also a risk that if we don't have an up-to-date plan that, the, uh, that, that there can be um, problems with us being able to give full weight to all our plan policies. Um, so when we're determining planning applications, if we don't have what's called a five-year supply of housing land, then uh, then there can be real uh, challenges in us controlling speculative development uh, in, in areas. And, and that would be similar to, could potentially be similar to the area that was the situation experienced in South Cambridgeshire um, while the last plan was going through, through its process. So it's a serious risk and we need to be mindful of, of that. So, Summing that up in terms of our objectively assessed needs, we say we need to provide for 44,400 new homes over the plan period and 58,500 new jobs. And that's jobs across all sectors. So businesses, um, industry, as well as retail and leisure and education and healthcare. So that's all, all a, whole, a full range of, of jobs. It's also will be important that we understand the needs of our Gypsy and Traveller community, uh, but that's one of the studies that has been affected directly by, by COVID because it requires face-to-face -face interviews. So that, that study has been held up, but as we move to the draft plan stage, um, understanding and meeting the needs of, of uh, our Gypsy and Traveller community will be an important part of the, the new plan. So looking at that visually, um, the, the, the brown houses are what we have um, today or in 2020 um, and the dark green houses are houses we already have in the pipeline. I think it's really important to recognise that through our current plans and planning permissions already granted we have over 37,000 uh, homes already in our, in, in our pipeline that we anticipate will be delivered in our new plan period. Uh, so that's a significant part of the uh, need we identified. Um, so that means we need to look for just over another 7,000 new homes specifically to meet that need. But also when you're preparing a plan, um, it's, it's good practice to have an element of flexibility built into the plan. And we're proposing a, around about a 10% buffer to give that flexibility so that if uh, one or more sites that are identified in the plan um, do not end up being able to come forward for some reason or come forward more slowly or later that we have some flexibility in the plan to continue to meet our needs as we move forwards. So when you look at that uh, current pipeline of, of, of housing um, that's distributed in a range of different locations, uh, some sites on within and on the edge of Cambridge, so the, um, Eddington, the university development in the northwest of Cambridge that's coming forward and also Darwin Green there. 
uh, developments of uh, north and south of the airport um, at Marley and north of Cherry Hinton, proposal uh, sites down at Waterfalls Way and uh, southern on the southern fringe with Clay Farm and Trumpet and Meadow. So um, a mix of sites already coming, coming forward um, around Cambridge and then some new settlements, um, uh, Camborne West, an earlier expansion of Camborne already uh, uh, in under construction, Bourne Airfield, new village now with um, outline planning permission, Norstow, a significant number of housing coming forward there now. It's really getting established and, and, and building out well. And Water Beach New Town also has permission for both parts of, of the new town. So a significant amount of provision already within our pipeline, as well as some village sites there. Um, and I think it's also important to think about um, the, the, the spread of those sites, and I'll come back to that in a moment. In terms of how we've thought about moving forwards to the, the sites to meet the rest of our uh, housing need, we um, undertook a couple of call for sites. Um, that's a very standard part of preparing a plan where you invite um, landowners and site promoters or, or anybody to put forward uh, sites that they think are good contenders for us to consider uh, and the council has carried out a detailed assessment of those through the housing employment and availability assessment <clears throat> which is a key part of our evidence and that looks a whole range of things um, everything from does the site flood does it have um, important um, uh, biodiversity or, or nature conservation uh, issues uh, uh, on, on the site uh, you know, right, right through to all uh, road access and um, uh, landscape impact and, and green belt impact and, and so on. So a wide range of considerations um, are looked at through that assessment. We also have as a council to check whether there are any other sources of supply or whether the other sites that we should have uh, should also look at. And we we looked at over 300 other possible sites. But most of those we screened out early on and there were 38 additional sites that we uh, we assessed. <clears throat> so over 730 sites have been assessed through through the healer and the healer provides a, a, a rating either red, amber or green using a sort of traffic light system for whether the site is suitable, available and deliverable, which are the three key tests um, for uh, a site to be considered. Uh, for inclusion in, in the plan. Um, if you look at that across the map, you can see that uh, there are the, the, the distribution of those, those sites. So they range from very large sites down to much smaller sites within and on the edge of Cambridge and, uh, and villages. So once we'd undertaken that work, we understand our need, uh, we looked at the sites, then, then how do we go about developing the, the, the preferred strategy that we're now putting through the out, out to members to, to consider. So we looked at the findings of all our evidence, that's the, ev the interim evidence we published in November last year that some of you may be familiar with, um, and the new evidence that we've undertaken since then and, and have now published with, with the committee papers. And we tested as part of that a range of different spatial options, everything from concentrating development within Cambridge out to dispersing development to the villages and a whole range of options in between the role that new settlements could have in that, the role that villages might have, um, and uh, the role of the edge of Cambridge, including land uh, within the Greenbelt. So we've looked at a whole range of potential options um, and what became clear through our evidence is that um, different types of location, different types and scale of sites have different impacts. Uh, and when we looked at those overarching themes that Hannah talked about, um, the preferred spatial option that we wanted to develop was one that had uh, least climate impact, um, that, it, that we're active and as in walking or cycling uh, and public transport for natural choice, very much where green infrastructure can be delivered alongside new development. And, and also that there's good access from that new development to job services and facilities, either close to where people 
live or that they can get to those services and facilities in um, uh, using sustainable transport options. So we looked at the sites in the Gila against the aims of, of the strategy, what would be the best, the best sites. Um, so we narrowed down from that very long list of sites that I mentioned earlier to uh, look at over 170 sites that we thought fitted broadly with that overall strategy uh, approach. Um, and that was sub subject to sustainability appraisal. Um, and from that whole wider process, we narrowed down to a strategy that um, includes 19 new sites in the first proposals. So you'll appreciate that's a very small proportion, only about 3% of the total sites that, that, that we, we assessed and 11% of those that went through the sustainability appraisal process. And looking at, um, at those sites and their distribution, the orange sites are the existing sites I talked about that all, are already in our current plans and um, now very, in, very many of them uh, building out or, or with planning permission. And then the dark purple sites there are the new sites that we've identified uh, to include within our new strategy. And I'll talk you through those, uh, those now. So just before I do that, just to think about, okay, so we're looking to um, minimize carbon emissions. As I said, carbon emissions result primarily down to transport methods. So we can, uh, we, we, we can reduce the impact of, on, on the climate from house building, but where you put those houses is really, really important in terms of the wider impacts. Uh, therefore, the new sites are primarily in and on the edge of Cambridge, um, and also we've identified Camborne as a broad location for development, and I'll come back and talk about that uh, in a moment, um, and only 4% of additional homes proposed at, at villages. As I said, green infrastructure really important alongside development. But before I go through the individual sites, one thing to be really clear about what our evidence has shown is there are real challenges in this area about water supply. I think we know that many of you living in the area will be aware of the, of the challenges in, in this part of the country. And also that um, uh, the, in terms of how we deal with the water supply, um, there, there are some, still some questions over that, and we'll talk about that further on in, in the briefing. But just to be really clear before I run through the strategy, we are clear that this is our preferred strategy only and if the, that an adequate and appropriate water supply can be provided. And by that, we mean a sustainable water supply that isn't gonna cause um, uh, unacceptable harm to uh, the chalk aquifer and the chalk streams in, in particular. And John, my colleague, will talk you through that uh, in, in a bit more detail um, a bit later on. So looking at the um, proposed new homes alongside the, uh, the current homes in, in the pipeline, when you look at that together, you can see there's a reasonable distribution of, of, of development. Um, and, and we've also looked at how, how is that distributed across the different types of, of locations. So um, a significant proportion of our existing and proposed allocations are uh, within and on the edge of Cambridge. Um, uh, the next greatest proportion at at new settlements and only a very small proportion in the rural area. And I'll, you'll see that there's a combination there of new sites, but also uh, additional homes from some of our existing sites. And I'll talk about those as we go through each of those locations in turn. And that really repeats what I've just been talking about. So our new allocations are a relatively modest uh, element of total delivery. Our current pipeline is by far the three quarters of our, our um, supply for the new plan period. Uh, in terms of looking at how we distributed the, the, the new development, um, our plan includes a 
settlement hierarchy, a kind of ranking of settlements based on their level of services and, and facilities and how sustainable they are in, in, in those respects. So Cambridge sits at the top of that hierarchy in this now single joined up plan. There are the three new towns, um, Water Beach, North Stowe and Campbell with its recently uh, uh, created town council. There are a number of rural centres which are our largest and best served villages. Um, the main change from our previous plan is to include uh, as, a, as a requirement of our, our rural centres that they have um, a, a really high quality and dedicated public transport connectivity either have or will have through the delivery of the Greater Cambridge Partnership schemes that are in preparation. Um, so most of them stayed as, as in the current plan. The only change is Cottenham, which does not and is not proposed at this stage to have one of those high quality public transport uh, connections to Cambridge and therefore we propose that Cottenham gets reduced. So, uh, and then as we, as I said, the um, strategic green infrastructure, green infrastructure and access to open space as well as open space that is not so much about access, but it's about biodiversity and, and, and really um, how we have a still a, um, a strong and vibrant um, uh, countryside and, and rural area around our, our development. And we've undertaken one of, one of the new types of evidence that we did this time is a green infrastructure study that looked really carefully at the, the special characteristics of different parts of Greater Cambridge and looked at where there is potential to really uh, take advantage of some of those characteristics to expand into new um, strategic green belt, uh, sorry, strategic green infrastructure in, uh, initiatives. So looking now at um, those different types of location, Cambridge urban area, I mentioned uh, that, uh, the, that that's the most sustainable location with best access to services and facilities within, within, within the heart of Cambridge. The main proposal within Cambridge is uh, in northeast Cambridge, as we've defined it, that red area at the top there, which is around the Cambridge North Station. It includes the Cambridge Science Park. It's, an, it's a brownfield site. Uh, it's a site that has been looked at over a number of plans, but um, the limitations of the existing water treatment works there has really um, constrained any um, serious reuse and regeneration of that brownfield site uh, with the proposal by Anglian Water to relocate the water treatment works um, uh, out of Cambridge that does, um, if, if that gets its development control order process um, successfully, then that would be um, a really good opportunity for uh, regeneration of that part of Cambridge using a brownfield site and northeast Cambridge came out um, very well in a, a whole range of our evidence um, documents as a, a sust really sustainable location for development. Uh, we also have West Cambridge which is an existing area by the university it's been building out over several plans now uh, still potential for further development in there and we floated the concept of potentially some residential development in that area to, um, to help um, make it even more sustainable. Um, and we're also flagging that there may be potential and maybe a good idea to start looking at that with the Eddington site, um, the other side of Anthony Road and pick that one up in a moment. Um, also within Cambridge, there are a number of, uh, of site areas that are called areas of major change where we're not specifically proposing development and we're not specifically re relying on numbers necessarily but we think that there are uh, there could be potential for um, uh, further development to come forward in some of those areas uh, and they are shown on the plan there so they're around the station area around Grafton Centre um, uh, and a number of, uh, of other locations. Also being carried forward from the Cambridge plan are a number of opportunity areas. Um, there are a number of, around places like Mitchell's Corner, along Mill Road, around um, the, the station and Hills Road and, 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 and several others. But we are proposing a number of new opportunity areas 
Um, we we're suggesting that the Newmarket Road retail park and also the nearby Beehive Centre as areas of very large um, retail sheds with significant amounts of car parking on just surface car parks are um, sites that may have potential as we move forward and climate change becomes even more important in our considerations for may have potential for development. Um, as I say, we're not relying on anything, but we are identifying those as opportunity areas. Um, the Abbey Stadium, either through making best use of that site or if an alternative site were identified through potential redevelopment. Um, and Shire Hall and the Castle Park area, um, up Castle Street there with the, um, with the relocation of the, the County Council's offices there. Um, Edge of Cambridge, um, the, the, the key new sites here are at Cambridge East, where we uh, are talking about um, bringing forward the safeguarded land that's been identified in previous plans for uh, new development with uh, the advice from Marshall that they intend to relocate the airport by 2030. We see that as a real opportunity for major new urban quarter for Cambridge. Um, it won't all come forward in the plan period, but um, uh, we think that is a really important part of the overall strategy. Um, we have not identified uh, that there's a need to release land from the green belt to meet our overall numbers, um, but we have looked to see whether there are site specific reasons for releasing any land. Um, so we, we, we looked at the Marshall proposal to expand further out into the green belt and we not being persuaded that's um, an appropriate or necessary thing to do. We have looked at the biomedical campus around Adam Brooks. Um, uh, they put forward very significant proposals to us and we, we don't feel that they are, are appropriate or, or could demonstrate the very uh, the exceptional circumstances that would be needed, but we think there could be a case for a more modest release uh, by Babram Road south of the campus and opposite the developments at Walks Causeway coming forward through the last plan, but together with green infrastructure and um, uh, biodiversity enhancements. And we think that Eddington, the university development, can provide some additional development within the built footprint um, without releasing any further new sites. So then moving on and looking at new settlements, we have the existing new settlements I mentioned, but I mentioned Camborne as an opportunity for uh, a strategic scale expansion, and this is very much on the back of the proposal for an east-west rail connecting uh, out to the west from, um, from, from Oxford through to Cambridge uh, and with a new station proposed at Camborne. And we, we do see that as being a, a, a game changer really in, in the sustainability credentials of Camborne. Uh, so we aren't identifying any specific sites or quantums of development at this stage overall, but we think it has capacity for a few thousand homes in our plan period. And then looking at the rural area, firstly, we looked at the area to the south of Cambridge where we have a number of existing um, uh, uh, employment sites. We have the genome campus already with a permission for a significant expansion for, uh, for business, but also for 1500 homes. Um, we've also looked at the Babraham Research Campus and we have proposed uh, that there is potential this time to release that site from the green belt as an island in the green belt with uh, a small uh, expansion in included there, uh, recognizing the significance of employment uh, and, and the clusters of uh, these really important high tech and biotech uh, sectors. <clears throat> and then um, the other uh, new allocations here at Comfort Cafe by uh, on the 1307 A11 um, and then two further ones, one at uh, Duxford which is a small site um, in Hunts Road there uh, and the other one is a site that does involve uh, release of land from the Greenbelt in Great Shelford. It's a site that's very close to the existing mainline station there which with the new Cambridge South station at the biomedical campus has really strong sustainability credentials and it's it's a site which um, 
still would have some impacts. We recognise it would have some impacts on uh, green belt and landscape, but it also it's not in the highest category of impact according to our evidence. So we have looked at, uh, at that carefully and we're, we've proposed a different type of a configuration of site um, to those that were put to us, but we're proposing a site uh, at Great Shelford for members' consideration. And then looking at the rest of the rural area, uh, there are several sites that we're proposing here. Um, two sites down in Melbourne, um, one a mixed use site next to the Science Park for a mix of housing and employment, and then a smaller site uh, at Moor Lane, Melbourne. Uh, a site at, at Highfields Caldicott, which um, uh, is a site can, with, with some existing development happening near, nearby that we feel is a, um, a, a rounding off of the village there. Um, also at uh, Highfields is a proposed, um, in, proposed uh, employment, actually technically in, uh, in Dry Drayton, but on the St Neats Road there, um, or just outside of the Newborn Airfield development. Um, and uh, a, small, a smaller site at Station Road, Oakington, that's the other Greenbelt, only, only other Greenbelt site in the rural area we've identified, and that's very close to the station on the busway and provides an opportunity, we think, to help provide some really uh, enhance the access to, to the busway stop uh, with limited um, uh, rounding off of the village there. I think the other ones just to mention specifically are at the uh, A14 services, um, proposing some uh, for, for some industrial and, and warehousing development there, sort of small to medium scale, recognising in particular changes in, uh, in retail patterns to enable um, transfer of goods from larger to smaller vehicles. Uh, and we've identified a smaller site at the top end of Cottenham uh, and uh, a couple of, um, an opportunity potentially in the, within the line of the bypass at Hill Stanton. And I think that's it from me. And I'm now going to hand over to John Dixon to uh, take you through the rest of the preferred options. Hello, everybody. I have a very unstable internet connection, so please bear with me. Um, first of all, um, we've published a large range of evidence base uh, alongside the plan. And one of the studies that we've produced um, the first stages of, but it will carry on, is our integrated water management um, study. Uh, Caroline has also already mentioned how seriously uh, water is considered in our, our strategy uh, decision making. Um, there are um, some quite significant proposals already planned um, in the wider area, some new reservoirs um, north of Cambridge that will help deliver additional water resources, but they are longer term, so into the 2030s. What's also being explored is whether they're more uh, available interim measures, such as connecting up with other supplies, which would potentially take pressure off the aquifer. There are um, water, separate water planning processes underway to look at these issues. Uh, the issues being noted as an important one at the Oxford Cambridge Arc level. Uh, there is a regional water planning process uh, being undertaken as well by the water companies. Uh, and we need to understand the outcome of that process. So in a way, you know, we are at an early stage in our planning. They are now going to almost catch up with us and overtake. So as we get towards later stages of the plan, we will know the outcome of that process and the implications for uh, the, the planning strategy we're looking at. Um, just to emphasize, the councils do take the issue very seriously. And we do take opportunities to highlight this at uh, a government level and other opportunities to highlight to relevant bodies to make sure this issue is being fully uh, addressed. I'm going to particularly highlight now some of the um, policy areas that we're looking at as we move through the plan. So as well as looking at a strategy for development, we start to look at what policies uh, would guide how that development would take place, what, what it would be like, the standards it would be required to meet. And this has been really influenced by the big themes we consulted on uh, back at the first conversation. I hope you'll see some of the issues that were raised through that consultation being now um, delivered 
in the form of policy proposals. So looking first at climate change, we've now completed our net zero carbon study, which is available to you on our website. And that's recommended some very um, strong standards in terms of uh, how buildings should be uh, constructed and particularly how they use their or gain their energy supplies. Effectively, they would require um, buildings to meet their energy needs on site. And if they can't meet them on site, to make contributions towards delivery of renewable energy off site, effectively helping to make our buildings um, net zero carbon. We've got strong policies that would seek to respond to the challenges of climate change as well and deliver uh, high quality designs and also support as I mentioned, that renewable energy infrastructure that we're going to need and some other innovative approaches like minimising waste uh, in buildings as well. Our next big theme was green infrastructure. We consulted um, back at the first conversation on your ideas for where green infrastructure is important. And then we've now completed our green infrastructure opportunity mapping project and identified a series of uh, major uh, green infrastructure opportunities that could be the focus of investments uh, coming out of our development and the focus of stakeholders also helping to deliver. We want to see sites um, delivering uh, improvements to biodiversity. There is a national requirement uh, on its way which would require sites to deliver a 10% net gain uh, in biodiversity, but we want to go a bit further. So therefore our policy approach uh, proposes to achieve a 20% net gain. And we've also got policy approaches which we seek to protect and enhance uh, our open spaces as well. Another one of our important themes from the first conversation was well-being and social inclusion and we've really looked to see how we can make health uh, a central theme throughout the plan. We know that some of these new communities that are planned are already planned and are now proposed in this consultation take a long time to develop and those early communities take a long time to uh, build up into, into places. So one of the things we're proposing is to seek uh, meanwhile users on those sites to help those communities grow. So how can we use temporary buildings and so on to create those uses upfront in the very early days of those communities. We also explore how we might create uh, inclusive employment opportunities uh, through developments such as can we support um, apprenticeship schemes uh, through building developments for example. Uh, our great places theme is always the theme picking up on design and we think we've tried to capture what we think good design looks like and what the expectations would be of developers building in Greater Cambridge. So I'd be really interested in views on whether we think we've covered all those aspects. Heritage is absolutely key to that and we've done a lot of work looking at uh, the heritage impact of um, future proposals in the area but also we want to propose um, even more innovation in the area of how we can help our, our heritage assets uh, adapt to climate change. Uh, on our home, uh, no, our jobs policies next, a lot of these will be fairly familiar in the way that they seek to guide where employment proposals might be suitable within and on the edge of and in, in our employment areas. So some familiar territory, if you're familiar with the old plan, we have got some new policies here, such as should we be asking for um, large employment areas to include areas of affordable workspace that could help a range of bus businesses set up in our in our communities as well as just those sort of you know larger um, high tech firms, for example. Um, we also are trying to look at what we might do for retail and our centres because we all know retail is changing rapidly. Our evidence. Even the work we've commissioned is now, a lot of that was done pre-COVID. We will need to keep, keep working on that, but we've proposed some ideas about how we can keep our town centres relevant. And we also look at other issues such as visitor accommodation, issues around Airbnb and the role planning can play uh, in, in those issues that sometimes they cause. Uh, on the homes, again, there's a lot of familiar policies in here. We still want to seek high levels of affordable housing. That's really important and to make sure the homes were built have the right space standards and they meet the range of different occupiers. As Caroline mentioned, we propose approaches here to how we might plan for gypsum traveler needs, but we still need to complete that evidence base 
as it was impacted by the COVID issues. And then on infrastructure, we've got a quite a strong policy approach seeking to make sure any sites are uh, very clearly integrated into the transport network and provide good opportunities for travel by active mode, cycling, walking, and so on. Um, we know parking uh, is, is a difficult one. There are areas, certainly in Cambridge, where it's possible to go for very low levels of parking because you've got real alternatives uh, to the car available, but in villages often you still need to have parking. So are we trying to take a design that approach? The one thing we think is important is our sites need to start including charging um, the charges for electric vehicles, we think, because obviously that change is coming very quickly and they should really be included uh, through the developments themselves. And then energy infrastructure master planning. Uh, we're already doing some work on this in Northeast Cambridge. We want to make sure that energy needs are planned upfront as part of uh, developments, make sure they look at what they need and how it can be delivered in a sustainable fashion. And on digital infrastructure, our previous plans required the basics, such as including um, ducting so you could get cables into dwellings. Our policy now goes a bit further. We've been working with uh, Connecting Cambridge to see whether we can set stronger requirements for our developers to make sure that digital infrastructure is available upfront and delivered to a high quality. So we think we've come up with quite a strong um, range of policy approaches and they will want real feedback um, as we develop those into actual policies. I'll hand back to Hannah. Sorry, just got to unmute myself. Thank you very much, John. We're just going to very briefly wrap up by talking you through the uh, process from now on in. Um, so this is the cycle of committees and um, advisory groups that the first proposals go through before we go to full public consultation. Um, so you can see that that lasts for the next month or so. Um, after that, we will discuss with members what changes are made to the first proposal before we finalise them for consultation. And you can see that full public consultation is currently scheduled to start on the 1st of November. That will be a mixed method consultation. We hope to do face-to-face -face as well as um, online consultation there. Um, we are testing our new digital planning platform at the moment, and um, we're, we're glad to sort of publish using that ahead of time so we can get feedback and so forth. So please do let us know what you think about that. Um, and really just look at our website um, near the time. I'll put up contact details at the end of this webinar for anyone who wants to know more, um, but we will be releasing more information about the consultation once we've got through that committee stage and we are um, into the, the, the lead up to the 1st of November. We've got lots of really great questions now, so I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen um, and um, start picking up some questions and we will hope to answer as many as we possibly can. So I'm just going to go from the top here. Um, question saying, what are the special circumstances thought to justify removing yet more land from the green belt for the expansion of the Cambridge Biomedical Campus surrounding White Hill and extending the city edge to Granham's Road, um, which the Trumpington Residents Association um, is, is said by the commenter to have opposed um, when the smaller modification to the current plan was proposed. I think maybe that's one that Caroline could pick up. Um. Hi. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I sort of explained that a little bit. Um, I think the question might have predated my, my introduction to, to the site, but we did look really carefully at this site. It is a site that is um, of national importance, arguably even more beyond that, uh, in terms of its, uh, uh, its biotech uh, companies and, um, and research and so on. Um, the promoters, um, the, the campus put forward very large proposals. They say they need more land um, as we move forwards. We, we think that there can potentially be a case for uh, exceptional circumstances because of that, real importance um, of that site, um, but we didn't think the full extent of, of, of the land that they proposed um, was um, appropriate. Uh, so we set out why we think there are 
potentially exceptional circumstances and we've set out a proposed boundary for that that I'm sure you'll want to look at but it was very much to try and provide some flexibility for continuing development at this really important site whilst recognising the uh, the sensitivities around that, that 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 area and keeping development at the lower ground and also maintaining an area for um, biodiversity and um, access uh, around it. Thanks, Caroline. Question, quick question about were the plans for jobs and homes estimated before Brexit effects were seen? We talked about COVID, but I wonder if you could just quickly fill in on Brexit. Yeah, we recognise a number of different factors that we'll need to update uh, with us, our uh, our our employment land review and that does include the effects of Brexit so yes that's very much on our radar too. Thank you. Um, question about the figures for jobs and homes suggesting a lot of single working adults as the homes required are nearly uh, one dwelling for every one and a half jobs yet most planned units look like family homes. Um, I'm not going to read the whole question because it's fairly lengthy. I know you can you can see it, Caroline, but I wonder if you could just um, talk a little bit about how the figures from jobs and homes relate. So the, we, we also commissioned evidence to understand the number of homes that would be needed to sit with our, our employment forecasts. Uh, and that looks at the whole of the population from young people, older people, as well as employed workforce. Um, the advice we've had is that, that you know, that there is a, a, a combination of factors that play into the amount of housing that we need. Um, this isn't necessarily a direct one for one, but what we've said is that for the uh, the homes above the homes to support the additional jobs above our standard method need to be fully provided within within Greater Cambridge. So it's not quite a one for one. Uh, so there's a number of different factors in there, and you'll see that in our technical information. What would be the best document for that person to read, maybe if they wanted to find a bit more of the method behind that? Do you think? I suggest as well as the preferred options document to look at the strategy topic paper and that will then point on to some of the individual evidence documents depending on the level of detail the person's interested in. Thank you Caroline. I'll let you go in a minute Caroline but I can see the next question is also around jobs and homes which is obviously your special area. Um, given the land already allocated and available for economic development in the current local plans how will the number of new jobs be controlled to not exceed 58,500? I think that's a really interesting question, isn't it? And um, and actually planning isn't, you know, it's not an absolutely exact science. What we try to do is to plan to the best of the evidence that we have. We know that this area has held a very high level of employment land supply for very many years. Um, and even when we've been delivering quite high numbers of new jobs, um, we've continued to have that supply. So it's a it, it's a bit like, uh, you know, these are very big sites that build out over a long period of time. So the likes of Grant Park and, and the Genome Campus and the Biomedical Campus have been developing over a long period of time. So um, it's not an exact science, but our forecasts say that they think the most likely uh, level of jobs growth is the is that fifty eight and a half thousand uh, jobs. Um, and we think that's the best figure we have available to 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 use for our plan making. Thank you. Um, the question around the Oxford to Cambridge ARC, which is a, a really interesting one, because of course the ARC are consulting on their spatial framework um, currently as well. What account has been taken of the proposals which include across the ARC area up to one million additional homes and between half and one and a half million new jobs up to 2051? Caroline, I, I, I thought I was gonna let you go, but maybe you could step in or maybe Stephen as well might want to say something about this. Uh, well, shall I, shall I start? Um, uh, there have been various figures quoted around the Oxcam arc. I think it is still very early days, though, uh, and I think we need to wait and see what comes out from, from government as it goes through it, its process. It has said that local plans are still, uh, you know, a really important part of the plan making process or planning system, and they're encouraging us to continue to prepare our plans, which are supported by very clear evidence. Um, I guess what we'll be saying is that we've, we've, we've commissioned evidence, we've understood what our area, uh, uh, we anticipate our area needs and, and suggesting that back to government as something that they need to take into account for our, our end of the corridor. Thank you. 
Um, there's a few questions here around the relationship between the local plan and the proposals from Anglian Water about moving their wastewater treatment plant. Um, so I might just uh, take these all together. Um, so there's a question around uh, the carbon emissions and what Anglian Water is saying about its uh, carbon emissions required for moving the water treatment centre, counting against the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan site. And if that is the case, how can NECAP, the, the Northeast Cambridge Area Action Plan, be considered sustainable or viable in terms of low carbon accounting? Uh, I think it's just, I'll, I'll just answer this one actually just off myself because it's a, it is difficult for everyone to understand, but Anglian Water, of course, is just one lo uh, landowner and, and, and site promoter as well within the Northeast Cambridge area. And we're not, the ones developing their carbon strategy. So I think it's really for them to, to talk to their own carbon accounting. Uh, the Area Action Plan puts in place its own ways of looking at that. And we have to divide our, our, our responsibilities as a local planning authority that will ultimately assess certain aspects of planning applications. Um, and what Anglian Water says um, is, is not really something that we can answer to tonight, but I know that they would be happy to answer any questions. Two further questions here, which are really related about the green belt. So, how can Northeast Cambridge development comply with policies on protecting green belt biodiversity, landscape, and so forth when the sewage works will be a huge industrial development on the green belt? This is not mentioned in the plan at all. And a similar question around uh, the green belt: Why is the the use of the green belt potential use of the green belt for the new wastewater treatment plant not included in the local plans discussion around the green belt? Um, Stephen, I think maybe you could come in on this one. Uh, thank you. Yes, I, I mean, in many respects, the, it, it's a good question. The challenges that we've faced in terms of responding to. Um, the wide range of, of, of consultation and feedback. Uh, but um, the, the approach by relocating the water treatment works to an alternative location uh, and looking at the evidence that we've published, it's clear that North East Cambridge performs as a brownfield site uh, very strongly against those priority issues uh, that people have highlighted, particularly in response to climate change, also in terms of accessibility and integration with um, existing localities uh, and of course uh, the the question uh, the questioner who who points out that well you could build houses on the green belt instead of relocating the water treatment works clearly the area of housing that would be required in order to achieve the um, meet our housing needs uh, and that would be substantially larger mm. Stephen, I think unfortunately Stephen's connection sounds like it's breaking up quite badly. Um, I think we. I come in, Hannah? Yeah, please do. Help. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's also important just to be really clear here that there are different processes in in place here. So the 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 council as local planning authority in preparing the local plan, we're not requiring the relocation of the water treatment works. That is being dealt with as a separate process proposed by Anglin Water and going through a separate development control order process is the title of that process that that will go through. Um, what we're saying is that if that process happens and the site is, uh, it, it, the site, the treatment works relocates, then the North East Cambridge site is a really sustainable location for development. And if that happens, that we would say that this is a really important, you know, really good and uh, positive part of our development strategy. But I think it is important to recognise they are two separate processes. Um, albeit I appreciate to you as residents in, in the area, it might not seem that that's, that's the case, but in technical terms, that, that they are two yeah. separate processes. Thank you, Caroline. I'm just moving on to another question about a different matter to do with water. Um, a questioner says, the counterbalance to water supply is flooding risk. How will increased building impact on natural soakaway and drainage? Camborne has suffered lots of problems regarding flooding and sewage management. Can you give an assurance that flooding has been properly considered? Um, and there is a, a sort of related question around um, the quality of new build housing and infrastructure 
and the non-delivery of committed green measures such as water conservation, which is an issue that the questioner says in Trumpington. Uh, maybe John, if you're still there with us, um, I know your connection was a little tricky. Um, do you think you'd be able to pick those up? I'll, I'll try, tell me if you can't hear me. Um, so as part of our integrated water management study, we've commissioned another strategic flood risk assessment, which really draws together all the information we've got uh, on flood risk that's available to make sure we're fully informed. We then want to include very strong policies uh, to require sustainable drainage systems and set strong standards to ensure not only developments are safe in themselves, but they don't impact on uh, downstream communities as well. So it, it's another really important issue of the plan. And um, we set out our approaches and hope we get a lot of feedback on, on how those policies will be developed. So yes, another one we take very seriously. Thank you very much, John. Um, and um, I'm just, uh, I, I've answered a couple of ones in writing, so I'm just going to um, skip past those. There's a question that says, how can circa a thousand sites distributed across the plan area be whittled down to 19? How can 19 sites be considered to address not just district housing need, but settlement housing need? Not everyone wants to live to the north of Cambridge, for example, and surely smaller but still sustainable settlements should be considered in order to provide a balanced approach to housing delivery. How is a strategy for placing all the housing eggs in one basket here going to be different from the failed um, in the case of UDC and the severely delayed Braintree cultures to tendering large settlement approaches taken by others? This is a, a really interesting one that as a team we have had many, many debates about from the sustainability perspective of, and, and the social, environmental and economic balance of sustainability. Caroline, I think maybe this is one you could expand upon. Yes, it, uh, it is a really interesting question, isn't it? Um, I think it is important to recognise that our, our, our villages, um, it is difficult for them to be providing really sustainable development on the whole because of the, um, the level of services and facilities and, and uh, connectivity to places like Cambridge or larger settlements. So when we looked at the, um, the, the, the carbon impacts of development, villages did come out poorest on the whole. We have looked at some villages where they have better services and facilities. Um, to provide some development. I think it's important to recognise that our plans also allow for what's called windfall development, which is development that can come forward consistent with our overall policies and within the, the built uh, sort of boundaries of, of, our, of our settlements. Um, and, and that does still yield quite a significant number of, uh, of homes and, and, and jobs over you know, each year. Um, so uh, it's just because we haven't identified every individual site that might come forward, uh, it doesn't mean there won't be any development in, in the rural area. In terms of that wider question about can, can we be confident our strategy will, will be successful where the where place, other places, for example, Uttlesford have, have, have not been. Um, Ultimately, that, that is down to an inspector to, to, uh, to determine. But if you look at the strategy that we have in our adopted plans, which does very much look at sites on the in and on the edge of Cambridge and through several new settlements, uh, that was found sound in our, in our last plans. And really what we're doing is very much sort of carrying forward that, that, that strategy. And those new settlements now either are coming forward or have, have planning permission. Um, and we're not proposing any brand new new settlements in, in this plan. So one of, one of the other benefits that looking at an expansion of Camborne has, for example, is that you're expanding an existing established uh, settlement, uh, as well as the benefits that would come from East West Rail. Um, we do obviously have to make sure that all the infrastructure to support all these proposals will come forward at the time we we anticipate and as we go through the plan making process we'll be keeping that under very close review uh, to check that we think it's an actually a plan that is deliverable and, and, and fit to be submitted for that examination. Thanks Caroline. We're at time but we've got lots of really good questions so um, if everybody is happy to carry on just for maybe another 10 or so minutes maybe we could just get through a few more of these and then we will pick up the other ones um, in writing. Um, I've got a, a 
question here around proximity and accessibility not being the same thing. The, the questioner says Northeast Cambridge has great advantages of proximity to places of work, but the reason it has not been developed in the past is surely that it is a site heavily constrained by access difficulties. Um, Caroline, is that one maybe you might pick up on? Yes, and, and, and again, that's a really good question. I think what I would say is that um, it, you know, there, there's certainly a lot of um, congestion around around that part of Cambridge, but when you now have the Cambridge North Station, you have the um, uh, Sir Knives to Cambridge busway, you have the proposed Greater Cambridge Partnership, Water Beach to Camborne, both public transport scheme and greenway scheme coming forwards. Actually, this is one of our best connected um, uh, sites uh, and it really does show that when we undertaken our transport modeling and, uh, and reporting that it, that really does stand stand out. Um, I think the other thing to say is that we are looking to provide homes close to those jobs in that area so that there's more opportunity for people to live and work close together. We know not you know not everyone will choose to take that opportunity but it does help um, to internalize more trips so that less people are having to travel out and into the area. But we're also proposing what, what's described as a trip budget, which is where we are um, putting in measures to make sure that there are no increase in the number of trips generated by this site uh, as, as we move forward. So really not expecting it to be somewhere where the car is um, mm. very much relied on as uh, not relied on uh, in everyday mm. use. Well, I think that reflects a really interesting change, doesn't it, in how we approach planning that is is no longer looking at purely the sort of uh, the road access as being the measure for which uh, proximity is, is measured. Previously, you might not have chosen a site because of the road access, and now it's a slightly different equation. A couple of other questions we'll get through. Sustainability seems to have disappeared from the list of seven overall objectives. Why? And do the objectives need to reflect that sustainability will depend on the balance between? Really interesting one. So I think we would say that sustainability is the sum total of all of those seven themes in the plan. Um, that really is the overarching principle behind planning in the present day that stems from the national planning policy framework and actually I think we were all, all really delighted to see that the updates to it recently to the NPPF actually really strengthened the definition of sustainability within the NPPF and, 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 and put more flesh on the bones for us to all work with there. So we we do talk about um, what that means and of course there's also the sustainability appraisal process that the plan goes through that is a really fundamental and important part of the process i think if we put sustainability as a theme it is so broad brush to divide it we, we sort of need to split that down into the environmental and the economic and the social and and we've actually chosen to and essentially split that down further to talk about climate change as, as a theme biodiversity as a theme and so forth um, I'm just going to quickly whiz through the next question, which is around Camborne being sustainable due to East West Rail, but this being a diesel track proposal would thus not detract from the sustainable attributes and mean that this does not qualify with our criteria. Um, I, I, we, the councils do have a perspective on East West Rail and electrification and um, Caroline, I don't know whether you want to just quickly say a little bit more about that. Well, Hannah, as you say, you know, the councils are very keen to see this uh, new proposal as being uh, an electrified uh, proposal, and it remains to be seen whether whether that is, is, uh, does come to pass. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we do need to recognise that um, train, al almost even if it were not electrified, um, still would have the benefit of getting a lot of people out of their individual cars and the emissions that that would, would cause. We have looked at balancing a com um, development at Campbell with, for example, releasing them from the Greenbelt on the edge of Cambridge, but really uh, we, we think that the merits of Campbell with East West Rail is sufficiently strong that uh, we don't need to release land on the edge of Cambridge from the Greenbelt, uh, given that really strong uh, national policy. So, um, you know, you, you weigh up the balance and you, you, you know, you reach a view guided by your principles. And we, we felt that that was um, a reasonable 
an appropriate strategy to put forward and we we're really interested to see what you know what, what our stakeholders and communities think about that through the consultation if members agree it uh, is, is the right strategy to put out thanks caroline um a question there's two questions here around transport modes which are quite interesting one says is transport looking only at current technologies buses cars bicycles etc or also at likely new technologies such as the shuttle that's been tested in west cambridge and the pods that were one of the proposals for the, the metro and the other question asks about how in terms of sustainable public transport how will the extra buses needed be accommodated within the city centre um, I wonder if I feel like Caroline you've had a lot of questions to answer um, but um, maybe that's something that um, you, you might start on and maybe John or someone else might want to come in on as well. Yes and I think Stephen is, is mm. perhaps um, uh, would like to come yeah. in on this one as well, but I think in the, in the outset, um, uh, we we have to look at what we know, um, and we need to look at um, what you know what the potential impacts could be. But absolutely, we're open to what new technologies might might be in, into into the future. But I think we need to understand almost as a not quite worst case scenario, but understand that on today's um, today's transport methods. Um, what the impacts would be and uh, you know hopefully if more sustainable and, and, and um, less impactful measures come forward over time that will only reduce those impacts uh, uh, moving forward but Stephen I don't know if you wanted to add to that. Well just to, just to build upon that obviously as Caroline said we have to anchor because of the test of soundness our proposals in an understanding of existing um, technologies uh, and the process will involve uh, reviews of transport modelling that's undertaken. Uh, but uh, we would then expect uh, absolutely through the plans process and in conversations with the combined authority of Transport Authority and the County Council uh, and Greater Cambridge Partnership to understand those opportunities that people have put in the chat uh, for enhanced technologies uh, and uh, in indeed ways of uh, improving behaviour change to take those sustainable choices going forwards. Uh, and you know that's an open com that, that that's uh, a, a real objective in most of, of the plan is to change patterns of behaviour uh, around how we we move around the development of of that movement, uh, regardless of mode in many respects, is a key component of what we're trying to uh, address. Thank you, Stephen. Um, quick question around the level of in and out commuting, which is taken as existing and what do we forecast? Well, I think this is obviously something that we are going to keep under, under review with the COVID and, and so forth related impacts. But we can tell you what our current uh, assumptions are on this. Um, Caroline, I think that's one you can probably pick up. Uh, well, actually, it's a very sounds a very simple question with probably quite a long technical answer. But we we use a, a transport model that the county council prepares, which has all sorts of clever uh, assumptions built into it, including around commuting and and, and so on, uh, both now and and into the future. So um, I think that's one of those questions we're probably <laughs> better to take away rather than to try and answer here. Yeah. Good, good idea. And there is a lot of evidence base published around that. So I'll put up the contact details in a minute um, and you can write to us and we can pick that up. Um, a couple of questions around sustainability. Um, one around uh, the willingness to challenge government around water supply um, and the MPPF allowing other sustainability issues to be a basis for, for challenge of government targets. Um, and then, um, well, maybe we should actually there's slightly different questions. So that one is really about at which point do we challenge government um, and, and what do we think the sort of the grounds are for that? I think our challenge to government around the water supply is not that, um, you know, we're saying that we think the, the government is sort of wrong about something, but it's really that we need their help to bring those water supplies on more quickly. Um, maybe Stephen, or would you like to say a little bit more? I know your connection is bad about this, but. Uh, yes, I'm sorry about my connection and dropping out of the last uh, the, the, the contribution before last. That, there's a really important conversation happening, uh, and someone else has referred to it in terms of the Oxcam uh, arc uh, and some of the environmental principles that underpin 
uh, that, that local councils are trying to push into government to underpin that. Uh, so there is a challenge being uh, mounted on uh, some of the established assumptions around uh, what is the good growth. Uh, and some of you, as I think might have highlighted, uh, uh, might have made comments in terms of the ongoing consultation around a vision. Obviously, one of the strong that people are aware of uh, for Greater Cambridge uh, particularly is, is uh, particular areas of influence to GC on the Stephen uh, has run out of bandwidth at the most important bit of his statement. Stephen, are you back at all? No, I think I think we're going to have to give up. Stephen has lost there. <laughs> um, thank you very much. We will pick up the the rest of the questions that we don't get round to in written answers. I'm just going to um, put up. Um, the contact details now as well, so that uh, you can have a look at um, and, and note those down. Um, let me just get that off on screen now. So um, you'll see there the um, website address for uh, where you can find out more information, where you can access the digital plan, you can access the maps and so forth through our website. Um, and also our local plan email address. And please do feel free to email us with any queries. We have a, a wonderful team ready to answer them for you and, and so forth. So we're always happy to clarify anything or help with any queries um, at, through that email address. I'm, I'm mindful that we are rather um, starting to get out of time now. So I think we should probably start to wrap up here. We can see a few other questions. We will take note of them. Um, and we're sorry that Stephen's answer about the Oxcam arc and about government wasn't comprehensible. We will put a fuller answer to that on our website when we do um, when we do do the written responses to all the other Q and A's here. Sorry, we haven't got around to all of them, but we hope it has been helpful for you. And this website will be up on, sorry, this webinar will be up on our website shortly once we've, we've got the recording processed and so forth. Thank you all very much for attending.